I elected to the superintendent of public instruction, I believe, in 2016, yeah. right? Yeah. So, and before that, Linda, Linda Eastlick was? Linda O'Dell. Linda O'Dell, excuse me. Linda O'Dell was. So anyhow, and he first served while I was on the school board. And so he's going to tell us some things about what his job as county superintendent entails. There's other schools besides the Payson Unified School District. And there's a college and all these things. So he's going to tell you all about it. And he has a video, apparently. PowerPoint. So that's good. Oh, thank you. Now, do you want me to press, bring thank my chair around? Um, press no, no, I, I've got it all, oh, you must have all done here. Thank you. Right. I was uh, telling Judge Chambers, you know, if they get hostile, I'd be a good attorney and defend me. And he said, oh, no, I'm a judge. So now, <laughs> <laughs> so now if you get hostile, you'll have to you'll judge me as well. Yeah. So that's how it goes. Listen, um, watch this. I'm going I'm to start out with this. is pretty cool. Ready? You like this? Oh, your baby grandbaby. Where, where is it? You're oh, on where is we're, it? We're counting down. Where is it? <laughs> I'm a there. grandpa! Yeah. Yeah. I've got a clock in there. I'm a grandpa. And uh, this is my beautiful wife. She's sitting... She came home and she's had a headache, otherwise she'd be here. You've, you've met Sylvia before. She's and Sylvia's an educator. She's attended meetings here and she's pretty feisty, so if, yeah, she has, she's highly opinionated. Uh, I'm, just, I'm very willing to convey her opinion, but she sat with the baby like this for hour after hour after hour. And for me, it's more like, okay, okay, here, here we go. A little more interesting once they can like, do oh. things. Fish. <laughs> Stand in a cash register. <laughs> All right. Uh, by the way, just, just real quick before I start. Uh, you know what? Uh, this baby was born. My, my uh, son-in-law is doing his uh, MBA at uh, Berkeley. Oh, that's a receipt of liberalism. So this baby was born. Yeah, they live just right by Berkeley. In a neighborhood, and so you know, I, I'm an Arizona boy. Uh, we flew over there, and you know what, folks? Until you see it, you know, you see it on TV, the homeless. All that, until you're actually there, you just have. I couldn't. I could not conceive of it until I got there. And and everywhere, homeless tents along every park. And I would take the dog for a walk, and I'd go to the park, and it'd be the basketball courts and tennis courts just filled with with homeless tents and yes. trash everywhere where there was a windy day and uh, oh, trash wow. was just blowing up everywhere and uh, people were wearing masks and, and uh, <clears throat> so for me it was like, well if this is what quote democratic socialism or whatever they call it, <laughs> but that, if this is, what, this is what it turns into, this is how it looks when it's mature, um, I'm out of here. <laughs> <laughs> I, told my I said, honey, you know, we'll fly you back here anytime, anytime you and your husband and the baby, you just tell me, we'll fly back, but I'm not sure I'll be back here. I think grandma will, but I'm not sure. I know it sounds cold, but it was hard for me. I, it was really tough. Um, so what does a county superintendent do? Yeah, that's a good question, isn't it? I ask that every day. Let me just, uh, here's, I, I tried to list some things. We are, we have eight districts and about uh, 23 schools all together, including charter schools and private schools. And uh, a lot of information has to be sent out. Uh, funding, monitoring the funding, all the funding that it comes through my office is distributed by the uh, treasurer to the Department of Education, Department of Education to through me, me to the schools, and then I monitor things going coming back uh, to make sure that everything is done with integrity. Uh, I appoint, I assist in financial matters. For example. Uh, let me see, uh, Winkleman had a problem this last week because the mine was on strike and they didn't have a, uh, they didn't have their check, they didn't get their check 
from the mine and so the school was about to be overdrawn and not, couldn't make payroll unless the Board of Supervisors, unless we approved their line of credit. Um, and it sounds crazy that you, you wouldn't think that a school could run on that lean. Um, and this is a relatively poor district. But um, so, so that's where I kind of jump in and work between the school district and the Board of Supervisors and the bank to, to make sure everybody gets paid. So things like that that come up. I appoint gov governing uh, board members when they're needed. Uh, I report to the superintendent of uh, public instruction on various matters when she asks, and sometimes even when she doesn't ask. Um, you mean Kathy Hoffman? Yeah, <laughs> Kathy Hoffman. The state one. Yeah, and uh, I contract with the board of supervisors. I conduct all the school elections, uh, maintain certifications assist government agencies to improve student performance, our education agencies, and, and, and that's a kind of a funny thing because this is a hard one for me because that's really what my area of expertise is, but it's really difficult for me to walk into a school district. A school district, it has its own superintendent, its own governing board. So if I walk in, you know this, if I walk in and say, you know you guys, your high school, has made a C for about four years in a row now. I'd like to help you. They're pretty much. <laughs> we got it covered. Everything's going great. And I don't really have authority to to buck that. But but I I can help. For example, I do. I have worked with Globe, and I work with. I was just down at Hayden today because that that principal that superintendent is very very open and wants to make improvements. And in fact, I will tell you, I found it interesting that. Little poor Hayden, okay, which is primarily Hispanic, right, made the same grade their high school as Payson. They both made C's, okay, but think about that for a second because the the difference in poverty is is way way different, and yet little Hayden pulled out a C, and they could make a B next year. We think anyway. Um, in ed education agencies with administrative matters, remember we have a lot of small districts, so, so for example, Young, they went through two or three superintendents and they had interim people, and those people do not necessarily know the laws or policies of Arizona. They've never been uh, through experiences in terms of dealing with a student or parents and what should I do here and still be within the policies and the law. So they will call me and I can help them with that. I can either go over there and help them I can visit with their board, or I can just advise them over the phone. And that, that's really critical for small schools that have high turnover and they don't have a lot of expertise. Um, and one of the things that, about this that I think is interesting for me, uh, what I, because I get calls all the time, you know, from whether it's Young or Pine or Payson or Winkleman, I want that superintendent fired. I want him. I want them out of here. And I'm like, <coughs> Mr. Board, Mrs. Board Member, you know, or Mrs. <laughs> constituent, you need to understand, look outside, there's not a long line of superintendents wanting to be a superintendent in young Arizona. So if you don't like what the superintendent's doing, you may, you may want to try and get them help and I can help them, but you can't just kick them out because look outside, there, there's no one really waiting out there be a superintendent in young Arizona, I can tell you. And things can go wrong real fast. For example, one of the people that didn't, uh, when they had a superintendent, they got rid of the superintendent, pretty good superintendent, they had a person come in and they weren't watching closely and the bookkeeper did not make the insurance payments. Put all the insurance checks in the drawer. Didn't send them, right? So that district lost their insurance, and, the, and insur as current insurance companies are, they're like, oh yeah, great, we're going to renegotiate your contract, and this is what it's going to be. And they said, but it was just that yesterday, and they said, well, this is what it is now. <laughs> so, so to have expertise or somebody who's conscientious and knows what they're doing is really important in those types of things. Um, County Education Service Agency for support, and that's a lot of my role, whether it's doing staff development, or whether it's working in Winkleman, like I did, or uh, wherever 
they need me or my staff to work, I am I'm there as part of that service agency. Also, implement and oversee adult education. So there are many, many people in these communities of Gila County that never received uh, high school education. They didn't get their certificate. And so I have built a pretty strong GED program. Uh, and along with that GED program, there was no testing facility, as some of you know this already, in Gila County. So if somebody wanted to be tested for the GED, they had to go to Phoenix. So we established a testing center in Globe, and we established a testing center in Payson, and we established a testing center in the San Carlos Detention Center because we also provide adult education to those uh, that, are, that are incarcerated. On the res and I have a partnership with San Carlos Reservation and also uh, for Gila County. If someone's incarcerated and they need education services, or desire education services, we provide that as well. Some things that aren't on there is uh, I work with a legislator. I, okay, I have obviously our 14 county superintendents. So we work, we work with the, the legislature. Uh, we'll work with legislators to drop various bills that we think might help the system. Um, and so I lobby, et cetera, that type of thing on a, on a policy or a legislative level. Um, also, when I help with uh, the preschools, if that's necessary. Uh, Globe has a pretty strong preschool program. Payson does not, and it's one of those anomalies. One, it's kind of a strange. You know, I always I'm from here. Okay, I was raised here, and so I always call Payson a quirky little town, and that's one of the little quirky little things. We tried to really push uh, preschool, and people were like, "Well, I don't need preschool." So, <laughs> so. I did not keep, I'm not one day beat my head against the wall. I put my focus on adult education. And so that's where I pretty much put a lot of my time, energy, and resources. So um, we do all that on a shoestring. I have a very small budget, basically. Uh, the Board of Supervisors funds six people in my office through grants and so forth. I fund a number of part time positions. I also am the only entity in the county that funds three offices. My, the northern, everybody else has theirs funded for them. <coughs> My offices up here are funded by me through grants and so forth. So, so I try and keep things very, very lean. And, and I don't go out and try and start a bunch of stuff because I'd much rather do what we do well. So if we can do this, for example, well, and then we can get people their GED, and then my next step is to then get them uh, some type of vocational training or post-secondary if they want to go to the, the uh, take an academic route, keep our hand on them and get them to that route. And if I do this well, I feel like I'm actually making more of a difference than I would if I were strutting around the schools, you know, badgering people. So try and keep it focused, clean, and what we do we do well. Let me see. This is kind of a little diagram, really. It, it, it's real simple. Things come in to our office. Donations go directly to a school district. We disperse that, and then there actually is an arrow that would be going this way, and there would be arrows going to each district's district, so that there's accountability back and forth between the state, local, federal, the, the county, the school district, everything has to match up. So a lot of my people, they're bookkeepers and accountants, and, and the thing about it is they're, they have to have a really high level of expertise because it's a pretty complicated system and they deal with, with a lot of funding. Um, interesting statistic here. The revenue that goes through my office, about 89 million a year goes through my office that we keep track of. We actually take from that for our services $30,527 is what we actually take. And, and I read, you know, I try not to read the paper. <laughs> <laughs> I was a coach, you know, so 
I'm your coach, you know. But somebody said, well, the, you know, you guys would have a lot more money if the county superintendent didn't take it all or something. Somebody wrote a letter like that. And so it really piqued my interest, you know. I had my deputy director work up the numbers, and it turns out that, yeah, we skim off about 0 .00. This is not point, this is not 3.39%. We skim off about 0 0.0339% for our services to the school. So actually they get a pretty good deal out of it. And we try and get as much as we can to the schools. Um, we do this, uh, for example, when there's uh, the school board elections, all those people have to fill out something. They, we have to make sure that they're actually, that they exist, that they are in where, where they're living, where they're supposed to be. Uh, we do all that. My staff checks all that stuff out. Uh, so we take care of the school elections, the override election. We, over, we work with the election department and the school and the bonding agency, the attorneys and the bonding agency, to try and get all the information accurate so that people have, uh, when they receive their ballot information, that it's accurate and it's clear, as clear as we can make it and that it's accurate. And, and things do go wrong. I just, the uh, Maricopa County superintendent just ran into a glitch because, and he's got a lot more, many more schools doing overrides because the, uh, the uh, letters that were pro for their override, five of them, the people didn't exist. Uh, yeah. And so, and so you, and, and that really struck me because I live in a small district, and I knew all the people that wrote the pro statements, right? And so it, it didn't even occur to me to call them and ask them if they exist, because I knew them. But I could see where in a district like Maricopa, or a county like Maricopa County, where that could slip by. So, so my little note, to, it was like note to self for my uh, executive assistant, Make sure in the future that everybody who writes, we document that we called, even if we know them, <laughs> that we document that we called to ensure that they actually exist. <laughs> just just because. Um, yeah, so um, you can, you know, candidate information, uh, I appoint college district board members, and then afterwards, canvas the results. So. We, that's a lot of work to do the elections because uh, it has to be accurate, it has to be right, because what you don't want is for something to, to pass or not pass and find out that you made uh, an error. And, and nobody really makes, or I don't know, I wouldn't do anything on purpose and neither would my staff, but there's so much involved, it's pretty easy to miss a step, I think. There you go. So that's kind of a thumbnail sketch. Once again, we do a lot of things. We give a lot of support. Um, we do everything we can to run lean. Uh, just some other things for me, so you know. There are, I could be gone to uh, things every day, every week. You know, spend the night here, spend the night there. I really try to be around. I try to be accessible. Um, when there is, uh, say, Arizona School Board Associations, uh, when they do something, people spend the night. I don't. I drive. To, I leave here at uh, 6:30, get there, do my thing. I drive home because I, I feel like a tank of gas for taxpayers. A tank of a tank of gas is a lot less money than a meals and a hotel room and all that stuff. So, so I try and run everything as lean, as lean as I can. Yeah, I'll, I'll answer questions. Okay, first off, first off, Bill. Hang on, just a minute. <laughs> um, we have another dignity dignitary that has shown up. We have our Mayor Tom Morrissey. Yay. And his wife, Chris, who is the Northern uh, Arizona uh, for Trump campaign person. The rah rah. Say that again slower. Turn it down. She's 
said she's and they go the boss. Oh, the boss. Okay. The boss. Like so anyhow, okay, so we've got some really good Trump supporters. See, there's another Trump 2020 shirt over there. Jerry's got one. We all have a Trump 2020 shirt. Anyhow, we all have them. We just don't necessarily <coughs> always wear them. So anyhow, um, so Mr. Sandoval, we have our Q&A. And first we start on this side of the room because Bill is always first with this question. And then we'll take a question from that side, okay. back and forth, okay? Fire away. So we're going to fire away. And here we go, Bill. If you answer this in your in your deliberation, your talk, I apologize, but I, I miss it. Is there a difference between superintendents of public instructions and superintendents of schools? And is there a difference? If there's a difference, what is the difference? Thank you. So, so, so generally, what you would say is the the uh, superintendent of public instruction. It would be so. It's for this district, the, the superintendent of public instruction for Payson Unified School District. Okay, that's how you see it. It's a district superintendent. Where I am as a county superintendent. So it's superintendent of schools in the county. So the same government done that in both? They have one or the other? Does it? Do they have superintendent of public instructions or schools, but not both? Is that right? Yes. The, in, the individual districts have yeah. one. And, and, and that brings up a good point because what happens is uh, people think that it is hierarchical. So they really, and I, I, I get how they could misinterpret uh, that, is they think, all right, teachers answer the principal, principals answer superintendent, superintendents, district superintendents answer to the county superintendents. That's not how it works. The, and, and I'm thankful for that, actually. <laughs> what happens is a school board, they, they are a very powerful public entity and they oversee policy. They hire an individual to implement that policy. That individual that they hire is the district superintendent. So that district superintendent answers to them, and they answer to their local constituents. So it's a very much, it's very much a local control type of system. So now, quickly, let's juxtapose that. If I were the person over the district superintendents, you would end up to some extent losing that local control. And, and I think the local control is a very, very important issue to all of us. So, so it, I'm glad, and the other reason I'm glad is because when somebody comes and they really have a hard problem they want to solve, I can say, well, you know, you know the district superintendent your school board are the ones that you can Badger for that. So, okay. good question. question over there. Patty has the mic. Push the button. Hey, Mr. Sandoval. Uh, I feel for your family being in Berkeley. I was born and raised in South Central LA, moved progressively south, and moved 14 years ago here. But I asked you one other time Back off the mic just when you were here about checking in the cell phones on these kids in the classrooms. And you had said at the time that you couldn't do it because of theft. But if you ran it like a valet service, put numbers on them that the teachers, they get a ticket, I think that would work. And maybe some of these kids might pay more attention to learning how to read, write, and other things. If the teachers were teaching them properly, and I'm sorry, there's too much of their own comments nowadays in the school. And I am grateful that my grandchildren got a good education before California went to hell in a handbasket. <laughs> Thank you. Well, um, and, and let me address it. I, I, I don't remember when we talked about it, but... Oh, oh that is somebody's too close to the speakers. Mine's off. No, it's off. Right. So that is, and once again, now that that is a school district superintendent school board policy issue. I don't have authority over the schools to tell them how they're going to deal with cell phones. I can tell you, when I was a principal and a, and a turnaround principal, we did not allow them in the classroom. Now, the last time I was a principal was about nine years ago, 
And uh, we actually practiced with the staff on how to take them away without getting in a too big a bra. And it can get serious. I had a I had a guard trying to take one away, and it was a big old kid, and he was uh, uh, had violent tendencies, and he took that guard in and, uh, <clears throat> and busted his eye open. Yeah. So I am not an advocate for phones, and the argument was always, yeah, but the kids can do the phones, we can do so much with phones, blah, 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 blah. And, and even for me, the phone is distract. Even for me, if I'm in here and I have 30 seconds and I'm not interested in what somebody has to say, I'm going to pull out my phone. So imagine kids, <laughs> all right? And so for me, uh, I think it's just better for them not to have it, but it is very much a local school district issue, and it is not as easy as you might think. Uh, it, it was very difficult. Like I said, I had to train, we, I trained my teachers how to address and how to take away a phone. It's not, it's not an easy thing. So, but I agree with you. I think they're distracting. One other thing. What about the discipline in school anymore? There's no detention. There's no Nothing. Well, I, I think we have to watch out for broad statements about there's no dis detention anywhere, or you know, because because remember we have 21 schools out there and eight districts. So if we take a sweep and say there's no detention, no, well, I think there's some discipline out there in in these uh, 21 different or 23 different schools. There's some discipline. Um, I think it's gotten more difficult, and I I can tell you. Uh, many times I had parents show up with their attorney and you know that meant we had to break up you know I'd say all right well if your attorney's in here then from now on it's going to be just the district attorney school district attorney talking to your attorney and our talks are terminated but I would much rather deal with it uh, and I will tell you this it comes down to very strong principles Strong principles make the difference. And our own teachers are with the kids, but it is the principles that make the difference. So, uh, and there aren't, some have the moxie and a lot don't. And there's not a lot of, not a lot of folks going in to it because it, it, it really, overall, uh, it, it's a lot of hours and probably they're not rewarded like they should be, and that's just how it is. So, but it is a principle. Go ahead. That's the land. Have you ever seen or read the school bus accident report from the sheriff's department? <laughs> no. Let me give you a copy. <laughs> and then we're going to talk about it. I, oh, <laughs> can I read it here? Am I going to read it here? Five days before this accident, <laughs> I met with Supervisor Humphrey, who said he would walk across the hallway to your office because I couldn't get anybody's attention here. The chairman of our school board here is too involved in recall election to, to do her schoolwork. But we went for months and months without a drug and alcohol test of $10 an hour drivers. We made $12 flipping hamburgers at McDonald's. Yep. <laughs> and uh, we're lucky we didn't lose 25 or 30 kids on the bus like they did in Kentucky twice, in California once. And this has been going on for two years. I've been complaining. And I talked to the president of the school board here once before the accident, once after. I'm not going to get her attention. And uh, I want you to look at the next to the last paragraph on the first page. I heard that the woman, when she had her accident, she called her supervisors first, while an adult female laid on the ground unconscious outside the school bus. And then the ambulance and police. I want to tell you that this school board here is completely out of hand. And if something's not done with it soon, I'm going to appear before the insurance company. And they'll get to straighten out. And once again, that, that is your superintendent and that school board. That is their issue. That, that is not something I have authority over. Now, I will say this. I will say this because I was just at a uh, meeting with all of the county school, all the school boards in Gila County. And it was last, uh, I think it was last Wednesday night. And so what they did is they did a whiteboard exercise and talked for an hour and a half on huge, on issues that they had. One of the big issues that came out was finding 
bus drivers. It is, they're not finding bus drivers, and they raised the salary to bus drivers, and then they gave, then they thought that would help. They didn't have them. They didn't receive as many as they would have liked. Then they gave them benefits. They thought, boy, we're going to get lots of applicants, and they still didn't, and it was across the county. It wasn't just Payson. So it's one of those things that is absolutely a difficult, very difficult problem. I don't have great answers for it, you know, trying to pay more. So well, one other thing, our president of our school board didn't have any problem getting our daughter's jobs or our son-in-laws or half her friends. Why can't she find a school bus driver? I'm saying that, that across the county, for all of the school boards, they're, they're not finding bus drivers. All right, and, and, and that actually seems to be Southwest too, because I do some consulting in New Mexico, and they're having the same problem. So uh, I wish I could be more help on that, but it's not a, it's not a, just a local problem. It is a, it is a county problem, a state problem. It's a Southwest problem. It's a rural problem too. Yes? On the question, is that mainly because of the children's misbehavior? That the, when the words got around that the drivers don't want to contend with all these un- uh, you know, I, I, I am not sure. I mean, I think, you know, you, I'm not sure because it's so widespread. And I think, it, you know, it's always, you have to be careful always jumping to conclusions or saying, well, it's, it, could that be part of it? It could be. Am I ready to assign that? I don't know. Yeah, we always want to assign. It's like, uh, I mean, every time I drink, uh, Bourbon on the rocks, I get a headache, so I'm giving up ice. <laughs> and, uh, you have to be careful. You have to be careful assigning it to one thing because it might be the it might be the wrong thing. Where it might be a a combination thing. I will say this: that it, it, that kids are getting more and more difficult to uh, to control, and parents are getting more and more difficult. To control, you know, it used to be the helicopter parent that hovered around the kid, and now they call them snowplow parents. And, and my wife, you guys know my wife, she had a snowplow parent that just ran over the top of her, just beat her up, and so she called the principal down. And the principal was like, just watched it all happen. My well, was like, what? That's why I say strong principles are such an important part of this deal. Um, so now you have unruly kids, but they have these. Uh, Snowplow parents, lawnmower parents, and uh, they add to it. But there's some. I think there are other factors as well. So good question. Good point. Go ahead, Pam. Let me see if I can remember how to turn this on. I volunteer along with a lot of other people representing um, nonprofit groups in this town. And we work with a with the casino under one of their programs, and to put a Christmas party on for lower income people. And this year, earlier this year, we decided to partner with Payson High School to help us make the tamales that we sell to put this on. And I want to just I'd like to commend the culinary teacher and oh, program yes. at Payson yeah. High School. Yeah. That woman is yes. wonderful. Yeah. And it was a wonderful two days. I hope I never see another tamale again. <laughs> but we had chef at the casino donated his one. Day, he donated a whole day teaching the kids how to make red red chili sauce or the red sauce that goes in tamales for the um, uh, beef ones. And the kids were wonderful to work with. And I just I I have forgotten the lady's name. I'm embarrassed to say. But she has just got a wonderful program there, and I'm happy to say we sold all the tamales. So uh, Great. we're going to have a wonderful Christmas party. Last year we had 130 kids, <laughs> but it was a lot of fun. And I just think that we need a shout out to something positive. Amen. Thank I know, yes. I know yes. the schools yes. have problems. God, yeah. I know they do. But uh, there is a bright spot at Payson High School. But well, I experienced that Well, thank you, fantastic. thank you. I appreciate that so much. And and you're exactly right. It it seems sometimes like you can stand back and say, well, those schools they're awful. But I can tell you, if you if you like this young lady, 
go to the school, in the school, and you actually work with teachers and kids, you will see that there are hundreds of great kids in this school and in this town and in this county. And there are great teachers who are so committed. Um, so we hear all the bad stuff. And the bad stuff, I mean, newspapers thrive on bad news, right? So that's what you're going to see. But all kinds of really good things are happening. Now, I'll tell you, my, all three of my kids went through Pace in High School. Um, my son is a mechanical engineer. He went through Payson High School and took advanced placement uh, biology, economics, English, history, calculus AB, calculus BC, went to ASU, was, it was entered into their engineering program as a freshman, okay? And, and he took algebra, he took uh, geometry and algebra when he was in junior high school. He went over the high school to take it. And so, it, and, and this is a kid who, this is Payson. All right, so it's not all bad. My other daughter, she's in nursing school right now. She has a BA from uh, uh, University of Arizona, and she's going to nursing school, and she's also a professional musician. Uh, she's a Payson High School graduate, right? My other daughter, same thing, professional musician, also uh, has, a, has her college degree and is, is uh, very successful. And, and so it's not all bad. It's not all bad. Um, teacher shortage is critical. It's getting more difficult to find great teachers, and so my mantra is always the best way to get rid of a bad teacher is work with them and make them a good teacher. So if I had my way, and that's why I say strong principles are the key, I would have principles coaching teachers, not evaluating teachers, coaching them on a consistent basis all the time, very short terms in between, just like we coach athletes. Um, but that, that doesn't, you know, I don't rule everything. But uh, there is a shortage of teachers, and people are not going into it. And that, once again, is all over the Southwest. They're really, people are not going into the profession. So, yeah, go ahead. Uh, two, two, all right. First, a question and a comment. Do the buses here have radios? They do have radios, and in fact, they have cameras, too. Yeah. Okay, I worked as a bus driver, school bus driver for most of my schools for six years. And I retired because uh, a student, a special education student that weighed 160 pounds, attacked a female teacher on the school ground because he didn't want to get on the special education bus. And I intervened and took him down. And I'm the one who got reprimanded. So uh, his parents even approved of what I did. Interestingly enough, after that happened, he never again objected to getting in the bus. But because of that, I retired. Because I knew sooner or later, somebody was going to do something, yeah. say something that was going to get me in a lot of trouble. And, 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 and Don, that is a great point. And, and as a, remember, I, I talk about the principal. Because the principal has to deal with that stuff and know how to deal with it. So remember I told you about my guard that got his head uh, broken open by a special ed student? Or, or by a student, he was. This was a special needs student. He was. He was big, and he was a tough kid, and generally really nice. But if, but what happens? They got a tug of war, and and he turned on him and busted him. Okay, so then, then when I came into it, I had to walk very gingerly. I had to figure out how to weave my way through the whole legal, special legal system to. To, to change his placement and so forth. And even though I would have loved to have, yeah, I, I, and those of you who know me know I'm an old wrestler. I love <laughs> me out. Like just, I'd be like, hey, I'm next. <laughs> yeah, take your shirt off, I'm next. But you have to be very careful and know what you're doing. The problem was it wasn't the principal, it was the supervisor of the bus station. Right, right. And then, so we, things can go south really fast. So, thank you for that. Okay, we're back on topic. <laughs> I want to get back to the bus driving. I, I can tell you from experience, um, my dad, he actually did the bus driving for a couple years up here. A couple of things happened. Number one, the kids were undisciplined. They ridiculed him. When he brought his bus in, he would clean that bus and keep it clean. He was ridiculed for that. He got no respect whatsoever. 
I taught at Gila College for eight years computer courses. Whenever I had to deal with the Navit students, they were some of the most undisciplined kids from this high school. The ones that were actually there to learn were the homeschool kids. And that's all I got to say on that topic. Yeah. It's, it's a discipline problem. Yeah. Yeah, well, and, and, that, it, and it does run across society. We know that. We know that overall, things are becoming undisciplined. You know, and, and I hate, yet I hate to pick on everyone because, you know, my my kids are millennials, and, but but they have the, my kids and their spouses, man, they work hard. They're smart and they work hard and they do have work ethic. Um, but it is definitely a, I would say, discipline parents. is discipline. They have good parents. Well, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't know. I don't know. Are really the backup problem. Yeah, you know, parent, parents are a big part of it for sure. Yeah. I, they're a big part. Go ahead. Marlene here? No, Marlene? Oh, Marlene, I'm sorry. Hi. I believe that most discipline problems are from home. And maybe all of them are from there. But here's the one thing. Our president just did a wonderful thing. And it was the right to try issue. And for terminal patients, they had to sign a waiver so that they could not sue. Because of... <clears throat> Their right to try had risks involved. But the point is, it got those attorneys out of the picture. Maybe some will slip through the cracks, but as a whole, they won't. Do you pass out uh, written rules, like for each, like for sports, like for the bus, like for different things? In and that would show a list of the expected behaviors and the rules and the regulations that the parents signed. Yes, each school district does that. The and SA that doesn't does help you keep these attorneys and parents out of your office? Well, I'm saying that it, no. No, it does not. Can you make, the, can you make it tougher, what you're having them sign? Well, I, I will say this, that for me, it, 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 okay, let me tell you a little story. <laughs> My last gig was as a turnaround principal. And what it was, some of you know the story. It had the highest violence in the country. It had the lowest student achievement in the state. So the, when I got there, there were 300 drug and alcohol incidents the year before I got there. Ambulances in front of the school, they were selling there were people selling hooch 100 yards from the school. Kids would run off the school grounds, buy vodka, homemade vodka, and run back and throw up in the halls. Okay. Um, I had the Bloods, the Crips, the Juggalos, the uh, Insane Clown Posse. I had them all on my campus. Here's what I found. Was I strict? Absolutely. If they were smoking marijuana on the campus, it was a 180 day suspension which for some kids meant they were going to die because they wouldn't make it a year out of school in that environment. If they were caught with drugs, it was a semester long-term suspension. Now, that was a punitive side. What I found, though, is, and where I keep saying, I keep saying, I say this over and over, it's about the principle, is when I started forging relationships with those kids, whose parents were a mess, and whose homes were a mess. And I started making them feel like they counted and they cared, and I took the time. I was never in my office. I was always complaining, oh, you're never in your office. So I had a walkie-talkie, to call my cell phone. That's why I always pass out my cell phone next. I'm just used to that. When I started forging relationships with those kids, that stuff, did it stop completely? No, but for the most part, it stopped, okay? It took a year or two to earn the trust. But it's more than being, it takes more than being more punitive. Because the, you can be as punitive as you want, but they'll always find a way, sometimes, and sometimes they'll be angry. And so, actually, when I retired, the secretary made a, uh, a quilt out of gang flags for me. And it was blue and red, purple, green, and white because we would pull their colors. Right. So you haven't lived until you pull the colors from a, from a crib or a blood, you know. But they, they, they got to the point where, I'll never forget one of my students, uh, 
he was a gang member, and he took a beating at the school. And I was gone for, you know, everyone saw that to be gone. I tried not to be. And they said, well, how come you fight back? He said, Mr. Shamble said, no fighting. Um, we don't fight, we don't gang fight on the campus. And it was because I had a relationship with them, and they knew I'd punish, what I punished them? Absolutely. <laughs> that was tough. But I had a relationship with them, too. And sometimes it meant extremes, things you can't teach other administrators. Like I swapped punches once with a, with one of the gang members, and, and uh, I, I was a little, he didn't have quite the belly, you know. So he wound up, I said, okay, let's do it. Because, you know, they, that's how they, they understand. They don't <laughs> understand it. That's how they know. I said, let's do it. He goes, you'll suspend me. And I said, no, yeah, I won't. I take your best shot. <laughs> I went like this. And so he wound up, and he hit me as hard as he could. Whack, and it went, whack. And, and you know, kind of skin uh, against skin. Everybody went, and I said, my turn. <laughs> and he bucked up. And then I just kind of went, and then I hugged him, you know. Well, that gang member was my friend for the rest of the time I was there. He would do anything for me. And when I said, hey, this is a free zone, I didn't negotiate. I said, this is a free zone. He kept, they kept it a free zone. Okay, so that relationship principle at the top, forging relationships and and giving the leadership that has, that makes other people forge relationships with kids. That's the key. So anyway, that was what are the questions you have? Okay, we still have another one down here. I'll pass. I'll pass. Okay. Thank you. Other questions? I have a question. Okay, so um, twenty twenty is an election year for two or three of the Mason Unified School District. Three. I think it's three, yeah. Rare for election. And then on the college board, I hear from uh, Cindy, your assistant, that there is one that has determined that he is running again down in Miami. But the other four have not, a five-person board, have not decided whether they're running again. But I do know that West of West. Highway 87, so that's other side. The other, the west side, that there is a person stepping down, and that there's going to be an opening. We've had a person step down, and I can appoint a person if you're on the west side. The the big thing for me to appoint someone is to ensure that it is someone that is going to work well with the college board with the other board members because the, uh, this is a very delicate situation with our college it's a provisional uh, uh, community college district and so uh, it really has to work hard and people really have to work together to make things happen for this district to be funded and so forth so I do have it if you're interested you can call my office you all have my business card um, and it is all I ask that it's somebody that really wants to work and work on behalf of students and and uh, and to me somebody who is going to represent Payson but they're not going to get into the Payson Dixon line thing where the <laughs> south and the north Hiva County thing, right we're working on behalf of all students so that is correct uh, and then the other question I had is you mentioned a 1619 rewriting of history programs. Well, I, and you and I did that in a, a kind of a private conversation, but I'll, I, I can tell it is a. Yeah. Well, I get all. I have a newsletter, and that I send out every week, and so I'm always going through stuff and editing and sending out all these articles from all kinds of different sources. And one of them I got that has popped up is this 1619 project. And the 1619 project is what I consider revisionist history to rewrite American history based on when the first slaves came over in 1619. So I had a publication that was about that. And, and <clears throat> for me, uh, you start looking at that from that, everybody has a mountaintop there, but you look from that mountaintop, in my mind, it begins to somewhat vilify and indict the founding fathers. 
like it was built on the backs of, and then you get into this uh, reparations and all this other stuff. Yes. And so, um, so I, you could call me a center or whatever, but it's a pub, you know, I, when I got that, I just looked at it and went. So I sat on my desk, and then a couple days later, I went back, because I was looking for, I'm always grabbing material from, for the newsletter. I looked at it and went. Toss it in the trash because so that's a project you'll see 1619. Um, to me, it's I'm not no, it's not me. That's a revisionist kind of. I, yeah. I, I, I I'm not going to say I I think the history that we have is rich, and I think uh, I think it's pretty accurate, and I think everybody has a perspective from where they grew up, but I don't think that. Uh, we should be rewriting all the history based on on that perspective. That, but I mean, that's not, that's just my opinion. More of a private citizen than a superintendent, I guess. Okay. Any other questions? All right. Thank you, Superintendent. Oh, thank you. All right. You do have my, you do have my card, and and please feel free to call me. Uh, people call me and chew me out all the time right. for stuff, and a lot of times I don't have anything to do with it, but hey, it, it grows back. You know. One more question. So you would be up for re-election in 2020. Are you running for re-election? Well, that's the plan. I hope you'll help me. <laughs> well, because you didn't bring any... Uh, you know, I, I have to write a letter of intent, Okay. and uh, Judge Chambers is ahead of me on this. But uh, I have to write the letter of intent, and, and my plan is to run it. Folks will have me. So thank you so much. You guys okay. have been great, and great questions. All right, thank you.